So I guess we'll introduce ourselves. I'm the second one on the list. I'm Graham Charters. I'm an architect and, well, developer advocate for Liberty or Open Liberty, which is a, a Java server runtime. Uh, and I'm Steve Paul. I'm just a developer advocate. I'm not an architect. Uh, I do. I JV pretend to be an architect. Be an architect. I pretend. I yeah. pretend. Um, I do JVMs and JVM development, but now mostly I come off and have get to talk to you guys about all the wonderful things that are going on. And cool. I should have gone to that slide, shouldn't I? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, the title of our talk is How to Get Along with Hatos, or Hatoeos, or however you want to pronounce it, without letting the bad guy, guys steal your lunch. Um, we came up with this talk. Uh, it's, it kind of evolved over time. So, I, I first came across Hatos. It's nothing new. It's been around for many, many years. I came across it uh, in talking to customers um, quite a few years ago. Um, where they kind of raved about it and said, Hatos is really great because it helps us write clients that are more robust or flexible when it comes to changing your server-side services, your microservices and so on. And Steve and I had a chat about this and things, and Steve always has a bit of a security eye on stuff when we're talking. He said, well, how about we combine that with, a secur with security and talk about the security aspects in relation to, to Hatos? And so that's how this talk came about. So I'm going to talk for probably about 10 or 15 minutes, and then I'm going to sit down and enjoy myself and watch Steve do the rest of it. So he's going to do most of the legwork. Yeah. Um, my bit, I'm going to be essentially be the uh, innocent developer who's kind of trying to write useful services, design services, so it's really easy for clients and, and developers to, to use my services. And then and I'm going to be the guy at laughs. You're going to be the evil guy. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so where to start? So when I first heard about Hatos, I thought, what on earth is that? Um, so maybe starting with defining what Hatos is, so we can all kind of level set and understand it. So it's just about the worst acronym I've ever heard of. It's probably a Friday afternoon down the pub acronym. Uh, it stands for Hypermedia as the Engine of Application State. So that was my original or my initial thought. So I thought, well, how on earth do we break this down? So let's start with hypermedia. Um, I'm personally someone who, when I see hyper or I see meta or something like that, I kind of instantly have a mental block. So I thought, well, I'll have to read about this and try and break it down in my head. Uh, so I found this on Wikipedia. I actually found a number of definitions of hypermedia. One started with a database, and I thought, well, that's not really right. But anyway, um, so this one actually I, I quite liked. <laughs> so we'll read it, shall we? Hypermedia, an extension of the term hypertext, is a non-linear medium of information that includes graphics, audio, video, plain text, and hyperlinks. So what I thought that meant, and I hopefully is right, if you think about hypertext, which is essentially a graph of text, so you can navigate through, the, through this network of text, and then introduce other, other types of data, such as graphics, audio, video, and so on. They're still in, in, uh, interlinked, so it's a graph of those types of artifacts. So you've got hypermedia instead of just hypertext. OK, so that seems to make a little bit, sense, uh, a little bit of sense. So we kind of any the wiser? A little bit, maybe. But what about this thing? And this is what I really struggle with, and I still, still struggle with it a bit today. I will try and explain it, and hopefully it'll make some sense. So as the engine of application state. So I continue to search and try and understand what Hatos really stood for and what as the engine of application state meant. Uh, and then I came across this, uh, this thing, which was a blog post by Martin Fowler quite a lot of years ago, so when REST was relatively new. Uh, and he, he was asked to review a book by Richardson and a bunch of other people, and I don't know the other names that Richard and Richardson has. Um, and in that book, they defined a capability maturity model for REST services, so, and it was called the Richardson Maturity Model. And who here is familiar with capability maturity models? OK, yeah. Cool. We usually get a few hands, which is good. So essentially, capability maturity models, what they try to do is break down some kind of domain into a number of layers. And it's usually, or typically, or actually probably has to be, if it's a proper capability maturity model, has to be four layers. And the first layer is you're not doing anything towards that capability. And it could be anything. It could be REST services. It might be database maturity usage. It might be... Um, yeah, well, pick, pick your favorite topic. You can do a, create a maturity model to represent that thing. 
And then the next layers kind of describe how mature your use of that capability is or your adoption of it. And so what they did, what Richardson did, is broke it down into four layers. So the first one is the lower layer where you're not really doing anything towards REST. And then you decide to use resources. You, next layer, you decide to use HTTP. And then the last, last layer was called this thing called hypermedia controls. And so what I'd like to do is go through each of the, those layers for two reasons. One, to try and help us understand what the, as the engine of application state means, but also to help you kind of understand as you go through up those layers, how much information you're actually giving to client developers and making their lives a lot easier. Okay, so the first one is the swamp of POX. Well, actually, it's showing its age because POX was plain old XML, and we all do JavaScript now, don't we? Yes. <laughs> all right, so let's have a look what that looks like. So, swamp of podge or plain old, plain old, uh, plain old JSON. Did I say JavaScript? Okay, so with podge, Essentially, what you do is you have a single endpoint which represents your service or your services. So there's just one endpoint that your clients are going to hit, and they don't really know what to do. Um, so you document essentially how they're going to call this service. So in this particular example, it says, "Well, I'm going to. You need to give me a request body, and that request body is going to give me a method. And in this case, if you want to actually update an account, that should be retrieve account because I wanted to do retrieve for all the examples." Um, then you're going to pass in an ID, and then you're going to get a response back in the body. And you'll see that this is using HTTP POST, because if you're doing this kind of approach, you're essentially just using HTTP to tunnel your requests. So you're not making use of the HTTP verbs appropriately. You have to use POST because that's the lowest common denominator, because you want to avoid people trying to cache your results, and you want to avoid people trying to retry your request, because they don't know what your method is going to do, what, it, what actually the result is on the back-end system, so they can't actually assume any, anything about it. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll, I'll give a demo of each, each one of these things, uh, and hopefully the demo kind of shows you how the information you expose to your clients um, increases as you go up the layers. So here, this is just an example of podge, or swamp of podge. So because I can send anything to this service, there's not really much in the way, I've got my endpoint here, there's not really much in the way of structural information I can provide. So this is actually an open API definition for that service. Uh, and I can try it out. And as we saw, uh, the first thing I need to do is provide a method. And I'll call it get account, because I just happen to know, and hopefully spell it right. Ah. I happen to know that there's a get account method. Uh, and I'm going to uh, pass in an ID. And I just happen to know, because I've made all my IDs start at 1 and, and increase from there, that there is, a, is a, a back-end item called that. And I'll execute it, and hopefully we've got a result back. Yeah, there we go. So we can see I've, I can actually call this API. But all I know as a developer without reading the documentation is there's actually an endpoint. And that's it. OK, so let's look at the le next level up, resources and resource identifiers. So what this layer does is say, well, actually, now we're going to start defining our endpoints in terms of resources. So start breaking back down our services into, into resource concepts. So for example, in, in my particular example, and again, I got the method name wrong. I changed the, I changed the examples yesterday, sorry. So this should say uh, get account. Um, so uh, as we saw in the previous example, we only had one, uh, one endpoint. Here, we've actually got an account endpoint, and I might have an address endpoint, and so on and so forth. Um, those endpoints can point to anything. It might be documents, images, uh, collections of resources, and so on. Uh, but again, it's using just HTTP as a tunneling protocol. So we're going to use POST, because we're passing actually the operation in the request body. So we don't know what that's going to be doing. It might be doing something we could retry. It might not. It might be doing something we could cache. It might not. OK, so we'll just let's have a look at what the API looks like for this. So you can see now we've got a little bit more information. So we've got an account endpoint, which is going to give me back a collection of accounts. And we've got a, an account with ID. And we've got an address endpoint. So let's just, we can try this one out. I don't actually have to provide any. Oh, yes, I do have to provide information, don't I? I need to provide the method. So on this one, I want to do get accounts. 
all seems a little bit strange. It might be a query method, for example, so that's why it seems a bit strange I'm doing get accounts on the accounts resource, but anyway. Oh, did I miss? Sorry? <laughs> Same typo as I did last time. Sorry, I got up at four o'clock to catch a flight. <laughs> so did I. Yeah, well, you're not going to do demos. Yeah. <laughs> So we've tried it out. Thank you. I was just testing it. You were watching. Okay. So you can see we've got a couple of results back. Okay. So let's have a look at the next level up. So the next level up is HTTP verbs. So this is where you actually start. And this is actually where a lot of REST APIs finish. Um, so this is where you start using HTTP as it was intended in terms of the HTTP operations that you can use. So the HTTP verbs. So post, get, put, delete, patch options, head, and so on. Uh, and so in this example, we've got the same endpoint. You can see it's account slash one uh, to request the, the first entity. I don't have to pass anything in the re request body. I could, even if it's a get request. If you do something in your service based on that body, then you're breaking the HTTP protocol, so you shouldn't do that. Um, so I don't need to pass anything in the request body because I'm asking for, I, I'm asking for account number one. Uh, through the URL, and then I get the response back. And the great thing about this is you can then, because I know I'm doing a get, I know that it, it can be cached, for example, the result can be cached. Um, I know if I do a post, I know the, the semantics associated with that and so on. Okay, so let's have a look at the example. The other thing to note, and I should have noted in this one actually, is um, with, the, with the request, let me just expand it. Actually, not, yeah. There's a little bit more structure information as well because now it's a resource. And so with this one, this is the, uh, the HTTP one. We've now got lots and lots of operations we can try. We've got a bunch of puts. We've got, some, uh, got a delete. We've got a couple of gets. Well, quite a few gets and a post for, or two posts for creating the resources on the back end. And so I can do lots of things. I could just do the usual thing and get all the accounts. And I don't actually have to type in any, uh, mistype any method this time, because it's all kind of uh, implicit in the resource. And I can do things like, um, uh, I can deposit some money into account number two. So if, uh, let me put a little bit of money into there. We'll put $20 in there. And we can see that's now gone up to, the balance has now gone up to $20. It was zero previously. OK. So that's all great. So now we've got much more information as a client developer. I know where all the endpoints are. I can guess pretty much what the operations are I can do. So I've got a lot, a lot I can start with without even reading any documentation. And so let's have a look at the next layer up. So the next level, level up was referred to as hypermedia controls. So the request looks the same. So I'm not going to pass anything in the body. I've got the, the endpoint URL that I'm going to um, send the request to. But you'll notice what I'm getting back in the result is I get the data, but I also get a bunch of links. And these are essentially links that tell me more information about this resource, essentially where I can go next. So if you think about this is hypermedia. Hypermedia is linked information. These are the links. These are telling me about the application, essentially, what the application is allowing me to do next or tell, giving me hints what I can do next. So I might be able to deposit into the account by sending a request to this URL. Uh, I can find where I am. There's always a self-link. Uh, I can go and navigate to the address, for example. But the other interesting thing is that the information you could provide back can vary depending on the application state. So, for example, if I have an account here which we can see the balance is zero, I don't have a withdraw operation because I don't let you go overdrawn on this particular account. If, my account. if I let you go overdrawn on this account, I can still include a withdraw operation. And so what you can do as a UI developer is you can not put the button on to do withdrawals, for example, on the UI. Uh, you can also, as a back-end developer, I can change where these URLs point to, and your client code doesn't have to change. So this is all great. So let's just uh, look at the last of the demos. Am I taking up too much time? Are we doing OK? So you can see they all look pretty much the same. But what we'll do is we'll get, uh, get all the accounts again. Let's try that one out. So the request is going to be identical, but you can see what we're getting back. We've got a couple of accounts. Um, Bob happens to be doing quite well. He's got $100. He's rich. So he can do a withdrawal. Uh, but we look at, sadly, Jane is not so well off. Jane's a developer. 
uh, and so she she doesn't have any money and she doesn't get the, the withdrawal link back. And just to show, kind of give the idea of how things can change, let's just... Uh, Jane did particularly well this week and we're going to give her some money. Uh, so Jane was ID number two. Huge bonus. And so you can see Jane is now a bit better off and she can now withdraw money from her account. Okay, so that's essentially the concept of, um, of HATOS as you get up the, the layers of the Richardson maturity model. So what does it mean to be as the, uh, the engine of application state? Well, if you think about REST, REST is about transferring the re representations of state from one system and an to another. It might be retrieving it through a get or might be putting that state to the system. And hypermedia controls are all about including information about what the valid actions or operations are you can do with that resource. So it's really about transferring the application state in its entirety in terms of the resource, but also the actions that can be performed. That's my interpretation anyway. All right, so very quickly, just a summary of the, of the layers. So the swamp, you get no help for the developer. Resources, it helps the developers understand what the backend resources are, but you don't really know what the operations are that you can perform. Once you get up to the HTTP level, you've got a little bit more information because you know how HTTP works, so you know what the operations are that you can start performing on those resources. And then the last layer is hypermedia controls, where not only do you know the operations, but you're also given information about the actions and, and the locations of, of requests that you can send beyond just the resource that you've been returned. Okay, so we're going to get on to the security side of things. Um, I found this quite interesting. So as I read through Fowler's blog post, he had this, this uh, little entry, and I, I kind of slacked it to Steve so because I, I found it amusing. Because says, a further benefit is that it helps, d helps client developers explore the protocol. The links give client developers a hint as to what may be possible next. And I thought it was quite funny, because maybe it's just me that finds it funny. If you do this to it, then it still makes sense. So a further benefit is that it helps hackers explore the protocol. The links give hackers a hint as to what may be possible next. So on that note, I'll hand over to Steve. Thank you. Do you want to flick into... Yeah. And you don't like the clicker, do no. you? I'll leave it there anyway. Yeah, cool. Okay, that was cool. Um, thank you, Graham. Right, so... Aha! Um, where do we start with this? I'm going to sort of basically take, say what he... take what Graham said backwards and just break it all up and explain to you that it's disaster. And then we're going to talk about actually how we can fix it. Right. Um, and so we're going to start with sort of like going all back, almost back to zero because we need to talk about the problem. And then we'll, at the end, we'll talk about how HATOS can actually help you with problems that you probably don't even know you have. But it's good to start with this very topical thing, getting rid of fake news. Um, this is something that we have in our heads, and you have fake, no fake news in your heads quite often, or people you work with do, because they just think this is reality, and it never gets questioned. So the first one is, you have a firewall, and that's all you need. Right? So many people you talk to, and they go, yeah, I've got a firewall. I've got two firewalls. I've got loads of firewalls. Right, and you go, okay. Do you think a firewall is all that you need to be defense, to defense things? You have all sorts of bits and pieces in your system. Your API starts in the middle on some server somewhere and it works its way out to the edge, okay? Right. The reality is that you can't have just a firewall. Your reality is there are vulnerabilities at every single stage, every piece of software you use, every configuration, and the bad guys out there are trying to figure out what mistakes you made and trying to get in there. So firewalls don't help you because they're looking for ways around firewalls, they're looking for exploits, they're looking for your mistakes. Right? And it does mean that nowadays you've got to do defense in depth. That is your best benefit, best approach. Right? So it's, it's, you put the moral equivalent of firewalls in all the different places, right? Every place you have something, which is why this talk is important, but it's not everything. You have to have, all the, you have, to have defense everywhere. And the thing that's really impressive is you need to have some de detection. 
you need to know that you're being attacked and you'd be very surprised or maybe not surprised to know that many many people have a firewall think that's great have no idea how they'd know that they were being attacked in the first place until they found that they've got no money or something okay so that's the first one the first one is you can't just have a firewall, you have to have defense in depth. All parts of your system, including the way you design your API, have to be part of the thought process of making the system secure. That's number one. Right. Number two. Oops. Number two. People think that when they get hacked, it's because some bunch of clever people have got together and they built a plan. We've all seen the movies, you know, the Ocean's Elevens, and they all do these complicated things. And they've got a plan. It's going to be amazing. Okay? And the fact is, that's not true. All the attacks that are going to start with you, apart from a fraction, don't start with a plan. Right? They start with a script. So just think about this, okay? This, imagine this is real life, okay? Imagine that you could walk out here today and you would see a burglar. Many, many burglars trying every single door. There's one here trying this door. There's one here trying this door. There's one here trying this door, All right? Of every single building across the planet, 24 by seven. This is going on now. You put something on the internet, there'll be somebody trying the door. And when I talk door, it's all those places that they can find their way in. It's automated, it's scripts. Pretty much, it's nowadays it's it's a small number of seconds before somebody will be probing your system and it's a small number of minutes before they'll actually be doing a target attack completely scripted they're discovering what you've got it's drive by attacking it's nothing personal it's just you happen to be around okay and if you think of it like this if you think about the number of times you may have had some conversation with with people in test as long as you're not testers um, where they say, I found a bug, it's a problem. And then you go, well, it's not really a problem. And they get really, a, they go, no, no, look, this is a real problem. Okay, and you may dismiss it. These guys find all those little edges and they use them against you. And they'll never report them to you, will they? Because you let them in, okay? So how does this start? What's the process? How easy is it? I said there's these scripts running. Well, they may find you really quickly, uh, but it's not the only place that they can do this, and, some, and a lot of this is still automated. Um, they might just use Google, right? Because Google indexes lots of stuff, doesn't it? And if you're using REST APIs, for instance, you might have published it. Uh, WordPress, for instance, is really good. WordPress has, if you're running a web, WordPress site, it's a nice architecture of uh, how it's set up, and there's even a link, there's even a specific WordPress file that tells you what the REST endpoints are. And you can find that on servers, okay? Or you might go to a place like this, like Swagger Hub or RapidAPI.com, places where you published your API, right? So they can just do that. And of course, you've told them all about your API. Or they may just do this. And this they'll do a lot. And variations of that stuff, okay? They'll just ping you. Try you out, see what I can find. And then once they've realized that you have something, they do more than that. So these aren't super bright, um, 10, 20 people, always different skills trying to hack your system. It's just scripts at this point, okay? So how do they hack you? Well, you do look at, you do use secure design principles, don't you, okay? Anybody seen this list before? No? Okay, not good. Um, avoid, secu avoid security by obscurity. Keep security simple. Some really good ways to think about how you design from a secure point of view. And you can be absolutely perfect in your adherence to those. Right? Well, not quite absolutely perfect, because the point is, what are these bad guys trying to do? They're trying to figure out where you didn't do that where you made mistakes, that's all it is. It's mistakes that you made thinking that you're more secure in all these aspects and they're looking for ways in, right? And we can now break down this to bit next level. So these bad guys prodding, probing your system in all sorts of ways and just trying to find your weaknesses. And you know there's always something that you did wrong, 
You may not know it, but it just happens, okay? So what do they take apart? Well, they take apart sort of like three ways of doing this. There's security disassembly, which is how do they get into the protocols, which will talk a second. Then they'll look at how they look at your app. And then the other thing they do, which we won't talk about, is how they reverse engineer you as a human being and find out what you know that can help them hack their system, hack your systems. And that's a big topic in its own. But this is going to be in a code conversation, so we're just going to do the first two. So, security disassembly. Anybody here got a website that's publicly accessible, i.e. that means somebody else other than you can use it, that doesn't use HTTPS? Anybody? Good. You'd be surprised. I can tell you lots and lots of horror stories that if the first web page that you can get to is HTTP, then I can own the client and the server without any problem at all. Okay, so number one is that, okay. But that doesn't really help you because all of these secure protocols have problems. These are four well-known big problems with protocols or implementations. Okay, they have really nice names. When the protocol's got a bug in it or a design flaw, it's horrible. It's a bug, it's a design flaw, the bad guys found it, okay? Remember what I said about defense in depth? If you just rely on one thing and there's a weakness, then you're done, okay? And then um, the other thing to think about is that the communications, you have an API, somebody's consuming your API. Between the two of you, effectively that data's public because you're giving it to somebody away. You're giving it away to somebody. Um, it can be discovered in the middle using man in the middle software of which there are loads and that's quite straightforward to implement and use and they can do that. Um, if you have an app, you've got logs on your app, you give your app to an app store and it gets downloaded and people can act reverse engineer it. Or the really common one is that they just stick malware, uh, XSS, or they're just on the browser and they're reading the code that you're sending down and looking at the API, right? It's easy. Right. So you have to realize that every piece of data you give away is going to get used against you. It's that simple. Right. Now, if you're using REST, ha, huh, REST is just real Christmas for bad guys. Yeah, absolutely. It's just like, thank you so much. If you talk to security professionals, of which I am not one, they will tell you that they love REST um, for all the wrong reasons. The basic problem is, is that with REST comes documentation, just like Graham showed, open API, Swagger. REST is an API structure that allows me to navigate through your API. And you've told me, because you said, I'm following these principles. So I can just guess. Yeah, I'll get users. Does that work? Oh, yeah. What happens if I do get users one? Hey, that works too. Oh, let's increment the number. Oh, that works too. Cool. Um, what happens if I try all these other header things? Do you do these work? Let's see what happens. I can try all those things, okay? Um, oh, you give me help cookers as well, cookies back as well. All sorts of information in, in cookies. What happens if I play some of the cookies? Will I be able to get into your system? You know, what happens if I do that? All sorts of ways of breaking your system. Um, more than that, I can go to different websites. There are some really nice websites that give me all sorts of information, um, like what, what you're running. I can look at your headers. Hey, you've got X powered by, cool, thank you. That tells me that you're running a really old version of Java. Thank you very much. This is real, okay? This information comes from a place called showdan.io, which is for IoT like Google is for everything else. Showdan indexes all the devices. It is an awesome tool, it is absolutely fabulous, and it lets me have data like this. So the boxes are, what ports are open on your server? Did you know that the ports are open on your server? Showdown finds it and records it for me, thank you. It tells me a whole bunch of stuff. It tells me what services, if it's a port, it understands what should be at the back end, like 80 or 8080, it'll do a quick record and take, keep your data, which I can search later. And it's really getting better at spotting what web text you've got. So, and this information is publicly available. Go to showdown.io, put your server's IP address in and see what you can find. All right, it's all there. Thank you. All right. So I can try all this, right? I can try all this different, uh, uh, I've got eight REST APIs. I can try the different verbs. 
I can play with all of the different cookies and say, what happens if I do form encoded or JSON and just try it out? Because I'm not only trying to figure out what your API does, I'm also trying to see if I can break it. Now, if I can break your application, then there's a possibility of another denial of service thing going on. But also, if I break it, I may be able to figure out what bits of software you've got more than I've been able to tell already. And based on the error that response that you give back, I may be able to get more information. So, for instance, if I get some people, you look at some web services and you'll go, uh, it's a nice path. Sometimes that path is on the file system. Sometimes it's just a nice complicated path in the application. But normally the response will be different. You'll normally get a 404 if it's a path, but if it's just some application path, you'll probably get something else. So that's good. Now I know that maybe I found your static endpoint service and if I do that, maybe I can start putting in paths to get to your password files, right? Dot, 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 dot. Okay, cool. Oh, and um, the stack error, the error messages you give me, they're really cool because when I break your service and you give me a nice set of information and it tells me string index out of range, good, I'm on the right track. I found something that influences your data. Um, you give me a stack trace. And it's given me information about what software you're running. So what vulnerabilities have you got? Thanks very much. Um, and of course, you're very nice. You tell me what version of Tomcat you're running. More vulnerabilities, okay? Bear with me. This has got a point, right? So all of this activity is called fuzzing. There are tools out there now, lots of professional tools, that will allow you to fuzz your APIs. Your testers may be using them. If you have pen testing, they may be using them. They try all these sorts of nice conversations. What happens if I do an ID of minus one? Or what happens if I do int max? What happens? And they'll try these things out. Okay? Real tools, professional use. And then there's a whole bunch of extra data things going on. Like Artillery Fuzzer is a tool that you can go download. Right? It knows how to apply this stuff. Big list of naughty words. That's not swear words, unfortunately. It's just words, things that people know may actually break services or get effects to happen, right? And then things like zero width space, that's really cool. Um, that's exactly what it says it is. Uh, but in translations between encoded to non-encoded, uh, sometimes they disappear. So, you, so they can be used to get round filters because they don't do it because the zero space things don't match because you're looking at this uh, I know um, you encoded thing but actually when it gets translated into strings they might actually disappear right so they're cool so all this stuff reverse engineering they're fuzzing you all the time right so understand this you've got guys prodding your system all the time scripts 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 right they know all the ways this happens you know you imagine millions of times uh, an hour, a day, this is happening, and they're learning what it is that makes the, gets in there. And all that information is publicly available because pen testers use it against, to test your system for you, and there's really great tools. Okay? So they do things like this, like hacking the client by just putting a man in the middle thing, really easy, uh, but sophisticated at the same time. I have to do something. Or I can just go to Google, as I said, and find information about your API. Google's got all sorts of interesting search uh, mechanisms that you may not be aware of that the bad guys use. Right? Uh, or they may just go read your logs. You forgot to secure your logs, and so somebody have found a way in, uh, and then once they've got access to your logs, all those nice traces that you put in about all the calls that got made, slash get, blah, 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 here's the data in your log. People read it, analyze it, try it against you. Or they just go and get the logs out of your app because you've left them on your iOS in debug mode or whatever. Okay? Uh, they can find your test endpoints because amazingly, a lot of these descriptions about endpoint configuration, Google picks up because you forgot to secure it. Right? And a lot of these test points, they don't have security. Because many people think this, 
We don't use security on our test endpoints because it's easier. Right? And people do that. And that's okay until your test endpoints get published and then people call them directly. Right. There's a lot going on here, isn't there? There's a lots of ways that people are going to use your use what you're doing against you. And REST is part of that story. Okay. You can see this. They're going to find all ways in there. They're going to fuzz your API. They're going to take your code apart. So when we say about defense in depth, you have to deal with all this stuff. Right? You have to figure about what you're going on. So the question is not the can you stop them. The question is what do you do to make it harder? What do you do to make the secure these bots that are coming and proning your system miss you? Go somewhere else. Because at the end of the day, all you've got to be is slightly less of a target than somebody else. Because these bots are out trying to find weak clients and then once they found one then the human beings will come in so what you've got to do is run faster than a guy next to you when the bear is chasing you it's just not your problem it's his problem so what can you do so let's talk about this let's look at it from rest point of view and we'll end up eventually with hatos right so first thing is your api design okay don't be too helpful what do you do to reduce fuzzing opportunities you make your paths a bit more opaque. Think about different ports. Can you provide different ways of engaging? Can you have out-of-band information that will drive your API that your developers can know about, but perhaps the bots won't pick up? So don't do things like slash API slash v1, right, when you can put something else in there, right? You know, I said about the list of naughty words and all those things. Everybody knows them. They know. They know exactly what you're going to choose, right? So just pick something that means some sense, something to you. Don't pick the obvious one, okay? Right? So the other thing is we have lots of examples. Graham demonstrated a lot of great examples of account number one, which is good for talking about, but it's not good for reality, Right. Why not? Well, you know why, because I can fudge that and just keep try 10, 11, 12, 13. So everything should be UUIDs. You need to be able to not give your the bad guy the ability to take some information and figure out what the next thing in the sequence is. Okay? Right. And by the way, when I talk about APIs, don't pick something really fantastic that's a project name. Hey, we're doing... Um, I don't know, it's, we're doing project Voxed. So it'll be get API slash Voxed. That's good. You get back, you talk on Facebook. I'm working on project Voxed. That gets picked up. It ends up being used against you. It happens. Right. So you've got to think about how you design your API right, so that it is less guessable by bots. Right? And then you've got to think about whether it always does what you expect. It's interesting to see how often people make assumptions about the technology that they're using. You have lots of dependencies. And you go, oh, yeah, that does this. If you think it does something, then you should write a test for it. Because one day it may stop doing that because it has a bug in it. And then you'll catch the vulnerability before the bad guys find it. And then when you're thinking about data, don't think about just validating, I get 10 fields in, let's validate them, fine. Think about all the combinations that are valid and validate those. And think about what you can do so that when the guys fuzz it, you can spot it and you can reject it. It's the data that you put out as well that can be changed. So if you have an endpoint that returns the whole list I've got a user, okay? I give back an endpoint and it tells me all about them, including their email addresses and where they live and all sorts of stuff, because that's easy. But that's not a good way to design these things. What you want to do is have APIs that are more like this, where you say, this API is for a particular activity. So it'll only give you the information that you need to do that activity, such as... The address. I won't give you the email in this one because it's not relevant to the function. Okay, so you're not giving away data. That's good. And then if you're doing things like 
uh, giving out lists of data, uh, like lists of dates. This is common. Here's a long list. Well, thank you very much. And now you've given me some dates. That's really useful. Okay. But that's not the only way to do this. You can do things like this. You can say, give me a starting date and I'll give you maybe offsets or something. So the bad court guys, the tools don't spot this tool is this data you're giving me is rich information. Dates, that's useful, thank you. Right? It's like, well, your tool can deal with it, your front end can deal with it, your customers can deal with it, but your bots can't because they have to figure out that that's what's going on and they just don't. Right. So I think I've said all of this. Write code defensively. Validate all the data. Assume that you're being attacked. That's a good place to go. Think about the error messages that you give out so that they don't contain too much information. Don't be too helpful because that can be used against you. Try and think about return codes and stuff like that. That's cool. Okay. Um, and think about all this extra data that's going. Have a look at what you're sharing. Um, change the way that you write code so that the path through the code is not driven by the data or not exclusively by the data. One of the things they try to do is the bad guys are trying to figure out how to drive your complicated code down paths that you didn't realize it could do. Okay, so and that comes from you not doing validation right. Okay, so there we go. Using REST APIs naively can get you broken, right? So you need to fix this. And you need to have logging built in as well, okay? You need to think about how do I track people? How do I know that they're doing bad things? So in the last few minutes, we'll go on to that bit. Hey, we've got to hate us again, okay? So what do we want? Hate us. API design reduces fuzzing, okay? Reduce the ability to go down unexpected paths. Makes, uh, reduce the ability of a machine to explore the API. Make it harder for a human to hack it. Okay. Detect, un detect unexpected behavior, but still end up with an API. So when Graham first showed me HATOS, I was just like, this is just silly. This just makes things even worse. But the more you think about it, the more you turn it around, you go, actually, this has got some value. Okay. So you can still do HATOS and do it wrong, Right, you can still have this sort of thing where it says, "Give me, you know, give me an account and get a whole bunch of links of ne next actions." Okay, right. So it's true that that information won't be available until somebody makes the first call, but then if you give it back like this, the bot can spot it and use it against you. Which I think is what I said there. Yes. So, think differently. Don't use Hatios as just a way of giving out links. Right. Because what you're really doing is you're giving people uh, a free pass. So you have, with all your services, there all tend to be interactions between them, okay? If you don't do something about it, what happens is, is that you give away any one of these endpoints. Uh, once you've inter in, uh, interacted with it, you get a set of links that tells you what you can do with the other endpoints, okay? What you need to do, okay, is move away. So if you use HATOS, you get the same links. What you want to do is start driving it down a different path with a different set of viewpoints. Graham demonstrated a little bit in saying, I don't always give you back the links, okay? But this is mostly hindering, okay? It's not really helping, it reduces, but it's not enough, okay? What you want to do is you need to enforce this flow. Whatever design flow you have, you want to enforce it. So you can use HATOS for that. Okay, hey look, I'm catching up with myself. So how do you do that? So think about this. Rather than just say you can call any point endpoint directly, have a front door endpoint, a gatekeeper. So here we are, here's one, and I call it, and I pass in my UUID, and it gives me back some data, and it gives me some links. Okay, that wouldn't be very good. That would be what I've got. But I can start to add in more information to the link. I can make the link specific to the caller. So it's not stateful, but it's specific. Okay. So I can start to have nice long links with all sorts of data in. Okay. And I'll talk about that show you in a second. Okay. So all these links that you generate, and I'll show you what that means in a minute, 
means that the generated link is specific to the caller, to this conversation that's going on. So rather than it being stateless, it's not really stateful because it's not stateful information, but it is tracking information, okay? So if you do this sort of thing where you go, I've got to basically get accounts, some certain links with some tracking information, and you have this second one, as I said about pulling it out. So you might go, uh, things like closing the account as on a separate API rather than on one big, a on one big list, right? Right, so that means that when all these sorts of wonderful things are prodded at you, how do I get your API to go down different paths, different size pages and that sort of stuff, okay? Which may be okay once, okay? Whereas before you couldn't validate it with a, with a, with a front door API, you can validate it, why? Because when I give you back the data, I can give you back links, okay? And inside the links, so here could be a series of links with um, tracking data in, okay? These links are still stateless. You can still call these um, over and over again. You do get, 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 get as much as you want. They can't be fuzz because they're unique. So I call you, I get back a set of links. Each of the links is unique to me as the caller, okay? But, I, but they could be encrypted, whatever. The fact is, right, let me show you an example. The fact is that you can embed in that link all sorts of tracking information because you can encrypt it and you can provide it. So Graham can call me, I can give him back a set of links. Inside those links will be this uh, tracking information. The tracking information is hidden and encrypted. And it says things like, what did he do last time? How big are the amount of data is he's asking for? Can I spot, so this call, Versus the last call, what did he do? Why, where is he going? Is he trying to pay through all my data? Okay. Or is he doing something else? Where's the IP address changing? Is somebody spoofing the, the link? What's going on? Which I couldn't do before. Okay. So the encrypted data is not fuzzable because what can you do with that? Okay. And then you have embedded in this data a whole bunch of in actionable insight. Do what you want with it, depending on the information you're giving out. He has to give it back to you because it's the only way that you're going to do the next piece of data. Okay. okay. So HATOS, if you use it correctly and you start to think about it as the engine of state, the ability to give back data in ways that are not stateful but allow you to track the end user, what does that mean? It means... You're going to be able to spot unexpected behavior. That's really good. And you prevent data fuzzing because they never ever make a call to you that you haven't said they, can, that they can't do. The first call in and then you're navigating through the rest of the application. Okay. I'd say if you use this properly, HATOS is a really good benefit to help you keep your system even safer because it prevents you being fuzzed, etc but actually it also gives you the ability for you to enforce the design of your system. You think about what you can get away with if you can actually start to encode the behavior of your system and you're thinking securely and you're thinking about how the system is designed. It's only part of your defense, but maybe it's worth looking at. And I will stop there. Do you wanna come back up? Yeah. yeah. That's it. Any questions? Stun looks. Can't see with the bright light. Okay. Anyway, thank you for listening. Um, I'm going off very soon. Graham's around for the rest of the day and tomorrow. And tomorrow, yeah. Yes. So if you're still non plus, come talk to Graham. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.